سبحان الله الحمد لله لا إله إلا الله أكبر سبحان الله الحمد لله الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيد الأنبياء والمرسلين وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين ثم أما بعد فأعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم قل هذه سبيلي أدعو إلى الله على بصيرة أنا ومن اتبعني رب الشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي أمين يا رب العالمين I actually have quite a few thoughts to share with you inshallah ta'ala today um, I hope that I'm making dua to Allah that I have clarity in thought and organization so that the ideas I have I'm able to communicate clearly to all of you inshallah uh, I know that the ideas I have are going to spark a lot of conversation. I know that because I've had these conversations before. I unfortunately may not have the entire opportunity to have those conversations in depth with you today simply because I have a flight to catch. Uh, but uh, hopefully, at least among yourselves and via email or other media, we're, we're going to be able to interact and share some additional thoughts, inshallah ta'ala. Obviously, you know, the subject matter at hand is what, how do we get the most out of you know, weekend schools, whether they're Saturday school or Sunday school, these efforts, how do we get the most out of them? And let me just premise all of what I'm going to say by saying that there's enough people out there to criticize the limitations and the, the results of Sunday schools or Saturday schools. And that's not a new conversation. It's a very old conversation. Frankly, I'm tired of it uh, because complaining about something doesn't make it better. And also it's, also, it's also ignoring the reality that for a good, good number of children that are coming to these schools from early ages all the way to their teen years, this is possibly the only Islam they will ever be exposed to. A lot of the kids, these kids don't even go to Jum'ah prayer because of their public school schedules. So the only, and their parents aren't very well educated in Islam. So the only Islam they're really much exposed to is at Sunday school. So whether we're doing a good job or a horrible job, well, you can't get rid of it. You can't say, oh, Sunday schools don't work or Saturday schools don't work because they better work because that's all we got. For a lot of these kids, they're not going to end up in Islamic school. They're not going to take weekend seminars that come from you know, Islamic institutions. They're not going to attend the halaqat. A lot of these families don't even know the address of the masjid. The only reason they know about the place is because they have to drop their kids off at Sunday school. It's the only time they get like, you know, very cheap uh, you know, daycare. But don't, I'm not complaining. I'm just saying that's a reality. And if we're going to address, if we're going to try to make things better for our ummah, the first thing to do is not to complain, but actually internalize reality and work with that reality. We don't, instead of, we've, I've been raised in a culture where all I see around us is us complaining about reality. I say, let's just accept reality for what it is, and let's work with it. And instead of fighting against it, work with it and say, well, well given these circumstances, what can we practically do? Now I'm going to take a few steps back before I talk about weekend schools in particular. I want to let you know that for a long time as I was traveling across the country, I was speaking at the forums that are mostly masajid, like the masjid scene. And the masjid scene in America is very different, and it gives you a picture of what the Muslim community looks like, but it's not a complete picture at all. It's not a holistic picture of what Muslims look like in America. It's actually the Muslims that are somehow associated with the masjid whether very directly or remotely, but they're associated with the masjid. There's a significant population of Muslims that is actually not in, a, in any meaningful way associated with masjid life. Their, their life is, basically the, the masjid or the mosque is almost irrelevant in their life. Okay, maybe Jum'ah, maybe, maybe that. But outside of that, not really, right? And so I decided much recently to maybe start visiting some college campuses having discussions with MSAs and even non-MSA groups. And I see a reality that's very different from the reality at the masjids. It's just a completely different population. And, you know, I recently I did a program, a, a kind of program I would usually do at a masjid. I did it at a college campus, at, at one of the premier schools. About 400 Muslim youth showed up at the program. Uh, but even, 200 boys, 200 girls. There was not one girl in hijab, not one. This was an Islamic program. It was tafsir. And I'm not complaining. I'm just saying this is a reality. And so instead of saying, why aren't you girls wearing hijab? I'm like, I, I better rethink what I have to give these people. What, I, what, I, what the message is that we have to share. 
And I'm bringing that realization to you in this discussion. A lot of you were raised, those of you that are parents, were raised as youth in somewhat of an Islamic environment. At least you, maybe some of you that were raised in the Muslim world heard the adhan every day. You saw men and women dressed in a particular way. There was a kind of interaction in home. There was a kind of respect expected between teacher and student in the classroom at school. There were things that were just part of your culture that are in line with Islam. You didn't learn them because you're good Muslims, you just learned them because that was your culture. Then you and I came to the United States. And now we're raising our children in a very different world. Where a lot of the things that we took for granted are just not there. A lot of the things that were normal to us, they've never even experienced. They don't know what that means. They don't know what it means to stand up in respect for the teacher when the teacher walks into the classroom. That's an alien concept to them. They don't know what it means to have the ultimate respect for the father or the mother in a way that you guys showed to your father and your mother because they talk back to you and they make eye contact and the girl doesn't lower her eyes when she talks to her dad. That's, that's, old, that's ancient centuries. Seems like a different lifetime. That is not your children, that's not my children. We're living in a different time. Our kids are more our friends than they are our kids. Right? So the cultural realities for our children are very, very different. And as a matter of fact, this is another very difficult reality. The reality that what we see inside the masjid, what we see inside the Islamic social scene, is actually very different from what America looks like outside, to our own kids. As a matter of fact, it's even different from what our own homes look like. For many of us, our homes look very different from the environment that we put our kids in in weekend school or masjid or whatever. So you know what? There's this very simple concept in, in psychology. What you see more often, what you see all the time, is be it becomes normal to you. And what you see rarely is strange, out of the ordinary. It's very simple. If you see a car going down the street this way, all the time, you're used to the fact that this is a one-way street. You see a car going up the street, you're going to be like, what's going on here? Psychology. Yes. Psychology. Like, okay, so what you see all the time, it becomes normal to you. That's, that's your definition of normal, because you see it all the time. What do our kids see all the time? Yeah, they, they, they see things all the time, that all the time, by the way, they hear, come, stop it. <laughs> they hear conversations all the time, and they hear things all the time that if we heard that we would consider them absolutely unacceptable. But the fact of the matter is they are hearing these things and they are seeing these things. Uh, upstairs in the group, I will not share the answers with you, upstairs in the group with teens, I sat them down and I said, what are some things you've seen in school that have been done to you or have been said to you that you would never tell your parents? Can you tell me? And a couple of parents were in the room and we had to kick them out. And I said, okay, now you can tell me. And they told me things and I can't tell you because you can't handle it. And they've seen things. They've seen things that you, you wouldn't even like, you wouldn't even see that stuff on TV. They've seen them in school. You know, they've experienced things. And so we are raising our children in a very different environment. Very different environment. And the only opportunity we have to give them Islam many times is weekend school. We, we can't just think of weekend school as an opportunity for education. We have to think of weekend school as one of the last bastions of upholding the flag of Islam in these children's lives. This might be the only reason they might remain Muslim. This is the scary reality. I used to be a Sunday school teacher in the 90s. I had kids I loved, loved. I see some of those kids now, I realize how old I am. And this kid came to me, I used to be my brother's Sunday school teacher. He's got a beard. I'm like, Oh my God, I'm old. <laughs> but some of those kids have been arrested. Some of those kids went into the drug life. Some of those kids joined gangs. Some of those kids turned out great. But you know what? I don't want to look at the great kids and say, aha, we did something right. I want to look at the, the, the stories that we don't want to pay attention to. And there's more and more of them. There are more and more and more of them. Now, your children ask questions. Why do girls have to wear hijab? What's wrong with gays anyway? Why do we always have to eat halal? What's wrong with pork? My friends eat it. 
What's wrong with, you know, boys and girls being friends? It's not like we're doing anything. They're just a lab partner. They'll ask all these questions to you, and sometimes you don't know how to answer. You, you just don't know. Because to them, these, you know why they're asking these questions? And you just say, it's haram, okay? That's it. What does that mean, it's haram, mom? What does it mean, it's haram? It's haram because I said it's haram. That's final. Why can't I go to the prom? It's, it's just a party. All my friends are going to be there. It's going to be awesome. I'm not going to do anything wrong. You are not going to the prom. Why not? Because we're Muslim. <laughs> Come on, ma. It's just a party. It's just a party. And then she's tweeting, my parents, parents can be so weird sometimes. You know, I wish we could be a normal family or whatever. The girl's tweeting that. She's putting it up. And you're blaming her. Actually, she's just following what she's seen all the time or he's seen all the time and they've accepted it as normal. And you telling them not to go to the prom to them is what? Is abnormal. Everybody else is going. Why do we have to be weird? Why do we have to be strange? So now our children are being raised subconsciously with the idea that Islam itself is strange. Islam itself is strange. And so they ask, why not the prom? Why not pork? Why not this? Why not that? Why not the other? But the big question, I don't care about any of these questions, by the way. I care about one question. I care about, and our philosophy for Islamic school, Sunday school, has to be revolved around this one question. You know what that question is? It's the scariest question of all. Why am I even Muslim? Why am I even Muslim? Our children may not be asking that question, but a lot of them are thinking it. And it's scary that they're thinking it and they're not telling us because they know we can't handle it. And we have to preempt. We have to know that that question exists and we better have an answer. And the opportunity to provide that answer is going to be in these weekend schools because that's maybe the only Islam they'll ever see. Now, Let's talk about weekend schools. Our schools were formed by people with good intentions several decades ago. And the intention was the children should at least know some things about Islam. We learned how to pray when we were five or six. We learned how to make wudu when we were six or seven. We learned how to read Quran by the time we were eight or nine. We knew certain du'as and certain surahs. We knew something about the life of the Prophet wasallam. so our children should know that too. Very logical. It's a very logical assumption. And so we built these schools and the, the point of the school was teach some things about the religion to practically basically. Does my kid know how to read Quran yet? Do they know how to make Salat yet? Do they know how to make Dua yet? Do they know how to do this or that or the other yet? That's, if they know these things, they're functional Muslims. Good enough. That's what the average Muslim is concerned with. Some of you parents are concerned my child should be a knowledgeable Muslim child. They should know the seerah of the Prophet They should understand the Quran, etc, etc. You're not the norm. You're the exception. I'm talking about most parents. When you're running a school, then you don't deal with the exception, you deal with the norm, you deal with the majority. You address them. You don't address the exceptional parents who say we, our children should be really knowledgeable Islamically. They're not, the, they're not the norm. As a matter of fact, most parents will come to you and say, why are you teaching my child like Arabic language? I don't care. Just tell them to read the dua. That's all I care about. And you'll have those conversations, you'll be like, where is this coming from? Because you're not seeing things from their perspective. That's all the Islam they ever were taught, so they don't see the need to teach their children any more Islam than that. They've drawn the line of how much Islam needs to be taught. Now, at the end of the day, we approach Sunday school for the last few decades as an educational institution. As an educational institution, where something will be taught. My theory, and I know many of you will disagree with me, and that's okay. But I'm very, I'm, I'm very uh, alhamdulillah or astaghfirullah, I'm a very opinionated person. <laughs> So my opinion has formed over the last few years, and I'm actually very rock solid in my opinion on this. If we continue to approach Sunday school primarily as an educational institution, there's something fundamentally wrong with us, not our children. They don't need an education. They don't need an education. And I'm gonna to try to prove to you why I come to this conclusion, very briefly. You take majority of the kids that are sitting in a Sunday school, not your school, any school, Take the majority of the teenagers that are sitting in a classroom across America and you ask them one question, not the question I told you, why am I Muslim? Ask them the question, do you want to be here? Do you want to be here for the next three hours? Just ask that question. Sunday schools across America ask this question. Vast majority of the children will answer with what? No. no. 
No. The only thing that makes it bearable is maybe my friend is suffering with me. <laughs> Our children experience five days of institutionalized prison called school. And then they have two days of freedom. They're out on bail. And those two days, we take one of those days and do what? Stick them in jail again. Four walls, teacher and prison guard in front. Look, I don't care if it's Islam or mathematics or social studies, it's a classroom. It's a classroom. It's restricting. You're inside this space. And by definition, children enjoy freedom. So the, the very starting point of our effort with our children is we're an uphill battle because by definition they don't want to be there. I say Sunday schools, Saturday schools, Friday schools are going to be unsuccessful and continue to be overwhelmingly unsuccessful with few success stories. And by the way, the exceptions prove the rule. They will continue to be so until we change the answer to that question. Until the answer to that question is, oh my God, Saturday school, I love that place, man. I love Saturday school. It is awesome. I love being there. Until that answer changes, we failed. Because we want them to learn something that we like for them, but they don't like for themselves. They don't like it for themselves. Learning happens when love is there. A good teacher is not a good teacher who can make subjects easy. A good teacher is someone who can make you love the subject and then make it easy. Our children don't love the subject. They don't even love school. They don't even like their teachers a lot of times. They just see teachers as someone who keeps giving them work to do and then embarrassing them for work they didn't do. This is my first reason to say we philosophically have to have a shift from an educational institution to another kind of institution that I haven't defined for you yet. I have other reasons to say why it's not an educational institution. I have many other reasons, but I don't want to waste your time with those. I've come to those conclusions after lots of trial and error with different schools. Many years ago, I was asked to run a Sunday school. I used to be a teacher at one, but after a while, I was asked to run a Sunday school. And I told the parents flat out, I don't think you guys are going to like what I'm going to do. I mean, you guys like my khutbas and stuff, that's cool, but... You're handing me your kids. You understand I have a very deviant philosophy on what needs to be done with kids. You're not going to like it. No, no, we trust you, Brother Numan. <laughs> okay, you sure? Are you sure? You sure you want to do this? Yeah, yeah, we're sure, we're sure. Okay. Sunday school teachers meeting came. I'm the Sunday school principal. Which books are we using this year? Which, which, which you know, t videos are we using this year? I said, we're not using books. We're like, oh, we're not, we're not using books? I said, no, we're not using books. What are we going to do? I said, nothing. <laughs> but what about the teenage kids? I said, especially them, we will do nothing. I like, well, this is a Sunday school. I was like, yeah, I don't like the word school. <laughs> it's the Saturday hangout. <laughs> the, 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 you know how every school has a motto? As a motto, the motto of weekend Islamic school is one hadith. Person depends on the religion of their friend. Watch out who you make friends with. Saturday school, Sunday school is a place to make good friends. Good Muslim friends. More than anything else. You young people that have been brought up in this country know, and they will tell you from experience, what saved their Islam was their friend. And what ruined their Islam was also their friend. Our children, for the most part, have non-Muslim friends. Or have Muslim friends that have little to do with Islam. We have an opportunity to create friendships under the umbrella of Islam at weekend schools. The majority of our task is to create friendships, to create a social environment where they feel comfortable, where they can hang out with other Muslims, and feel like they can talk to them about anything without being judged, they can play with them, they can chat with them, they can hang out with them, they can do trips with them, they can do super awesome things with them, and then we can slip in a little learning, because wanting to be Muslim, loving being Muslim, 
wanting to identify with other Muslims is far more important than learning to recite the Fatiha. Because the Fatiha, if not recited with sincerity, isn't the Fatiha at all. The learning will come, but the love has to be there first. The identification of themselves as Muslims has to be there first. And that to me is the primary objective, especially of 11 and older. 10, 11 and older, all those groups, your primary objective as people that are running the Saturday institution is to create opportunities of friendship, discussion, conversation, advice. We just hang out at Saturday school. We just hang out, we just chill. Once in a while they give us something to memorize or whatever. Once in a while we learn something, it's slipped in. It's like a 70-30, 70% awesomeness and 30% learning. I even say 80-20. And then up the dose. Now you'll see some kids are serious. Not all kids are the same. Some kids are serious. They're like, I need more ilm. I don't need basketball. I didn't come here. I came for Islam to Saturday school. Fine. Those kids should have a specialized class. Don't bunch them with everybody else. They can have a specialized class. But they also need to learn that their, the, the, their, their love for knowledge needs to be cons balanced with their love for their fellow Muslim brother their fellow Muslim sister. We learn Islam so we help each other. Not just so we get advanced and leave other people in the dust. And we need to teach that not just to our teachers but also to our students. One of the diseases in our Sunday or in Saturday institutions is that we love the kids that do well on tests and we hate the kids that don't. My God, you only created this institution for the kids that don't do well on tests. The kids that are doing well on the tests are the kids that are already, the parents are already doing a good job anyway. They don't need the institution. And then we say, our Sunday school is very successful. This one child did so well. <laughs> Are you kidding me? How many kids did you have to skip over before you gave me that example? That one child doesn't prove anything. And then the worst thing you can possibly do, please take my word seriously. I know, and you guys are free to do what you want as a school. Every, every school is. I'm just sharing my ideas as I've, as I've experienced them. I, I don't think you'll find a bigger fanatic about Arabic studies in America than myself. I don't think. I've given my life to this thing. I just want Muslims to know Arabic. So they can experience Quran directly. I'm obsessed with this language. I'm a student of it. I will continue to be a student of it until my last breath. But let me tell you something. I am also the biggest opponent of Arabic at weekend schools. I am the, the staunchest opponent. You will not find somebody who opposes the idea of teaching Arabic at the weekend school more than myself. I love Arabic. But I hate it at weekend school. I don't believe in it. You know why? Because our kids don't know why they're learning it. It's a, Arabic is a labor of love. You haven't created the love, there's no point. Secondar, secondly, secondarily speaking, Arabic language acquisition cannot be done once a week. There's enough research for that. The world's leading institutions tried weekend programs for MBAs to teach them foreign languages, and they failed. They said it's not possible. And these are people who want to learn, and pay top dollar to learn, and learn from the top leading professionals, none of which we have in our schools. And they don't produce results. You think you and I are going to produce results in Sunday school where kids don't want to learn, teachers aren't actually certified language instructors, and they don't have that experience either, and they don't even know where to begin, so they try one curriculum one year, the next another year, the next another year, and we're, we're sticking to the Arabic, because Arabic is really important. What is wrong with you? It's not how it works. What is Sunday school supposed to be for? Let's identify that. Also, let's identify that that institution, Saturday or Sunday school, will not be successful until we create an orientation for parents. Where this conversation happens with all the parents. Look, this is why we're coming here. We need your cooperation. If you want more for your child, then the weekend school is actually a milestone. And there are several you know, smaller milestones in between during the week that you have to accomplish with your child. Not the child on their own, with your child. You have to do some learning, you have to do some discussions. And then it's reinforced again at the end of the week. And then in the middle it's yourself. The weekend institution for schooling needs to be an education and orientation for parents as much as it is something that supports students. And then you will say, well, nobody will come if we do that. If we put restrictions on the parents, they won't sign up for our school. Are you interested in numbers or are you interested in bringing about change? 
If you're interested in numbers, hold yourself to a standard and say there's going to be a parental orientation. It's going to be five hours long. It's going to be two Sundays in a row, whatever it's going to be. If you're not willing to do that, you cannot be in our school. And I know we're Muslims. So there are people who fight and say, no, we have to put our child. We're very busy, blah, blah, blah. I'm sorry. That's our policy. We don't like policy. We like bending the rules every time somebody comes along. That's why, and then we have the, when we complain about corrupt Muslim governments, we can't even run an institution with rules. Have rules for your institution. Stick to them. Put expectations on parents. There are general guidelines, and if we, if we follow them, we're going to start seeing results. Parents will love us for it. Our, you have to also understand, most parents don't know what they want. They don't know. They're not educated in Islam, most of them, and it's not their fault. We have to help them. We have, but we have, they have to let us help them. So we have to put you know, guidelines in place. Older grades, especially I mentioned, discussion, hangouts, basketball trips, take the kids out, Go play a video game or something, have young youth group leaders, have chaperones, make them go on camping trips, right? Watch a sport, sports game or something, whatever. With the girls, oh, I don't know, go to Starbucks and just sit there and talk. <laughs> just talk, and they'll love it. What'd you do? We talked. It was amazing. <laughs> I'm not making it up. It's been tried and proven. What do you want to do? Let's just talk. Okay, let them talk. Let them t I felt really good, you know. Girls just, they just need somebody to talk to. Great, give them that. Don't stick them in a classroom. Also let the girls be by themselves and let the boys be by themselves most of the time. Because they open up more. They're more comfortable expressing themselves. Boys at teenage age, teenage years, they're very conscious of girls, man. They're very conscious of girls. They, they think 10 times before they say something like, is that girl going to laugh at what I say? <laughs> That's how they think. They're not going to open up. When they're by themselves, they'll be themselves. And then there are boys that are extra loud thinking that's going to impress the girl. That's what's going on in their head. I know it's Islamic school, I know, I know. But you have to know teen psychology. You have to know that. This is what you're dealing with. Just because they're doing Islamic, advanced Islamic studies doesn't mean he doesn't have hormones anymore. <laughs> He is who he is. You have, to, you have to realize that. Then girls are super conscious. They're super conscious. You know? They're, they're very afraid of embarrassment. Super afraid of embarrassment. You have to make, give them a comfortable environment where they can just talk and nobody will judge. And they're, the girls, the problem with them is they don't necessarily care too much about what boys might think. They're more worried about what the girls next to her might say when she opens her mouth. If she rolls her eyes after you make a comment. I have a question, I didn't understand, and the girl next to me goes... <laughs> and the whole scene plays in her head. <laughs> I'm not going to ask a question, because the rolling of those eyes, that is death to me. <laughs> I shall not experience that in my life. So I have no question. I'll just continue to chew my gum, or something. We have to open these kids up. We, I'm telling you, I'm telling you, if we, in weekend Islamic schools, or Islamic institutions, if we accomplish one thing, if we accomplish that our kids are openly able to talk about what they experience in school, and they're, op they're able to get you know, answers to their curiosities through discussion, not through lecturing top down, but discussion, interaction, understanding, if we can build that, if we can build that, then we have succeeded in what we needed to accomplish. Because our children don't open up to us. They don't openly say what they're having doubts about. My, my, you know, one of my kids had a doubt. You know, she had, her, most of the kids in her school are like uh, uh, Muslim and 20% are Christian. And she came one day and she said, Abba, which one of us is going to go to Jannah? Because I mean, they're, they think they're going to go to Jannah. And we're going to go to Jannah. But you can't all go to Jannah, right? Because you can't be... You, it's either right or you're wrong. So maybe we're wrong and maybe they're right and maybe we're right and they're wrong. I'm so happy she said that. Because you know what? I had the same exact thought when I was her age. I'm happy. I didn't freak, freak out. I was like, you're right. That's actually a pretty cool thought. And I had a long one hour just conversation, not a lecture, just a conversation with her. 
And a conversation means I have to listen to her as much as I talk. You know? And she's like, oh, okay, I get it. Okay, I understand. At the end of it. I was like, oh, you understand, huh? What do you understand? Explain it to me. I forgot. And then she explains it to me. I say, okay, you do understand. I got you. You know? But you know what? Our kids, if they have these thoughts, they think a hundred times before they tell their parents. They're afraid. Our job at Sunday schools, Saturday schools, is to open these kids up so they can freely talk. So they don't keep those thoughts to themselves. Because they keep those thoughts to themselves, they will fester inside. Maybe they will share them with their non-Muslim friends, and then they will get non-Muslim kinds of answers. And then further and further, as those questions develop, they will, the question, why am I Muslim, will get stronger and stronger and stronger and stronger until they are old age, they are now professionals, They're, they've gone to college, and then you meet them. I've met those Muslim kids that are products of Sunday school, that are professionals, they're well off, and they're living in cities on their own, away from their parents, and you say, are you Muslim? It's like, yeah, actually no, but I'm just, I just say I am because my parents would freak out. If that's what you want, you'll get it. But if you want genuine Islam for your children, then this is the only opportunity we have. And if we squander it saying, oh, our children know how to recite this surah really beautifully. What does that mean? What does that mean? A, ch a child can recite the surah beautifully and still hate Islam. We're worried about the quantitative over the qualitative aspects, the psychological aspects of our religion. I'm not undermining the quantitative aspects. I'm saying they should be there, but they should be there at a smaller percentage, especially in weekend schools. And we should actually have a plan of action where parents can be the active instructor for their child on some of these other areas, which actually makes in Islam a part of the household. If that's part of the package, if that's how we're putting it together, then we will get somewhere. We're going to get somewhere. Otherwise, we're kidding ourselves. It's the same old machine for many, many years. We feel good at the end of the graduation ceremony when we get some child to come and superficially recite a surah or sing a nasheed. And everybody's like, and we give them awards. What does that mean? What does any of that mean? These are, these are the things we used to do back home in Pakistan or India or Bangladesh. This ain't Pakistan. This ain't India. This ain't Bangladesh. This ain't Morocco. This ain't Egypt. This is America. You have kids that are, wallahi, I've seen children that have memorized Quran and they're at their graduation ceremony and they're missing salat on purpose. The graduation ceremony starts after Maghrib. They're sitting in the lobby playing on their iPhone. And they're talking about, man, my dad's going to get me a PS3 because I'd finished his. And the salat is going on upstairs. And I'm going to be reciting. Which surah do you think I should recite for the graduation ceremony? Because they understand. You know what's in their head? I became a hafiz for a trophy so my parents can show me around. And where, I'm gonna, where am I going to lead taraweeh? And what prizes am I going to get? He doesn't even know why he memorized Quran. He doesn't still see the value of salat. And that's not his fault. That's not his fault. We created a culture where there's just a trophy. The trophy culture, the prize culture. You know? Acad we love academic achievements. We love them. That's the Pakistani thing. That's the Egyptian thing. We love academic achievements. He came in first. First prize goes to this child. Second prize... <laughs> what is he going to make? Achara out of that prize? What is he going to do with that prize? You know? He's not a better Muslim because of that prize. And let me tell you something else while we're on the subject. Because we treat weekend Islamic institutions as educational institutions, we have great books. I love some books. Like Aisha Limu's books, I'm a huge fan. Islamic Aqidah al Fiqh, Islamic Tahdeeb and Akhlaq, brilliant books. They are food for such awesome conversation, really. And they're, they're springboard from which you can have great real conversation with kids. But you know what we do? There's a test on chapter 21 to 29 this week. And the kid who's good at English in school, is going to get a hundred on the test, not because he loves Islam, because he's good at English. And he got the, you, that, all, the all the test proves is this child is intelligent. It proves nothing about their loyalty, love, appreciation, internalization of Islam, nothing. So we're reducing something that's supposed to be affecting our personality, we're reducing it to something that's supposed to be parroted. It's supposed to be parroted. That is the fundamental problem of weekend institutions. But it's not beyond repair. It can be fixed. It can be fixed. It'll take a, a, a cultural shift. It'll take a real internalization from parents and each teachers that we're here for a particular reason. You know, this, this is what, what the weekend school is for. Discussion, understanding, you know, internalizing, removing confusion. 
if we can make Sunday or Saturday schools an opportunity where most of the talking is done by the kids, we're good. Where most of the talking is done by the kids, not us, then we're good. We just lead the conversation. We lead it in a direction. Today our topic is this. What do you guys think? Today our topic is what happened in Boston. What do you guys think? You need to know. You need to know when, you're when, when children say, man, my, my friends call me terrorists, but it's okay, they're just kidding. It hurts me that they've even accepted it. They've accepted it. And they haven't had that conversation with you. And therefore you've never had that conversation with their school. It hurts, doesn't it? There, there, there are kids that say, when, when this Boston incident happened, there were kids across the country that said, I don't want to go to school. Muslim kids in Oklahoma, Muslim kids in New York City, I don't want to go to school. Now why do you think they don't want to go to school? <laughs> They're going to be harassed. Things are going to be said to them, and they know. We get it every time. We need to be able to have those conversations. These kids need therapy. These kids need self-confidence. Why am I Muslim? There are two dimensions, the last part of my conversation with you, there are two dimensions to the answer to the question, why am I Muslim? There are two parts to that answer. One part of that is emotional. There has to be an emotional attachment to Islam, a psychological attachment to Islam. You can call it a spiritual attachment, an emotional attachment, a psychological attachment, but that's one side. The other side is an intellectual attachment to Islam. There's two sides of this. When they build good friends, when they have teachers they can trust, when they can have insightful conversation, when they develop a, a, you know, this bond with their friends, then you've covered the emotional side, which is missing right now. The fact is it's missing. When you guys get the training to discuss the evidences for Islam, the proper the, the power of the Qur'an, how is, well, it's not even humanly possible that this is a human being's world. When you internalize that, and you can have those conversations, then eventually it will fill the intellectual void. But the intellectual void is at the end. For children, they don't need the intellectual. What they need more is the emotional. That's more important. When that foundation is built, wallahi, you have a lifetime of learning. There's a lifetime to learn. It's going to be awesome for our kids. They will want to learn. If we can get that out of them, we've succeeded. The Sunday school I told you about where I was in charge, where I especially took over the teenage kids. Little kids, it's okay. Little kids, they have fun doing pretty much anything. They could color dinosaurs or, you know, paint the Kaaba or whatever. They'll be fine. Make sure they're having fun though. Just make sure they're having, they have good memories of Sunday school. Don't put tests. Get rid of tests. No tests. Ever. No tests. I'm saying it several times because they're like, no, no, little bit test, little bit can I have little bit. <laughs> no. لا اختبار ولا امتحان ممنوع تماما Okay? No. No rankings, first, second, third, fourth. Don't pit the kids against each other. Awards, however, rewards. Rewards for participation, leadership, brotherhood, you know, consideration. You broke up a fight, you know. You, you just corrected this person in a respectful way and you told this one not to make fun of that one. I respect that. You know what? Here's a Snickers. Here's a, here, you know, here's a ticket to the ball game or whatever. Award good behavior. You know? Get rid of the school mentality. Create a place that kids love. And you'll be creating something that inshallah ta'ala will last. So the story I'm going to end with, you know the Sunday school I used to teach? I had the most troubled kids. Teenage boys. They said, you take those. I said, oh, I'd love, love to take those guys. These guys come in, man. Sunday school starts at 10. They roll in at like 11.30. Yeah, I was just, you know what I'm saying. And he's just sitting like this. I'm supposed to be talking about the seerah? I'm supposed to be talking about usul al-fiqh? I'm supposed to be talking about a textbook? I was like, nah, guys. Yo, bro, you, you guys want to play ball? Yeah, 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 let's play ball. We go outside, we're playing ball for an hour and a half. There's Islamic studies going on inside. We're playing basketball. And when we're done, it's like, yo, there's a half hour before salat. You want to go just grab some... Dunkin' Donuts. I'll get in a van and go Dunkin' Donuts. You just talk. Come back for salah. I see you guys next week, yo. My treat. I take him out on a treat. 
Next week, they start showing up at like 10.30 instead of 11.30. Only half hour late. I was like, hey, hey, guys, let's go to the beach. <laughs> yeah, honestly, I took him to Robert Moses, hang out there. Didn't bring up, I didn't talk about Islam. I did not talk about Islam. I just hung out with these guys. Maybe four or five months in, I said, okay, hey, guys, you know, when you're playing, there's this hadith. And now they're listening. They're listening. And they're, they're applying. You know? So before we start playing ball, I said, you know, basketball raises tempers. If somebody blocks you, you, you got to own them back. You don't take it sitting down. Basketball is an ego sport. But you know what? This religion is about checking your ego. So if somebody blocks you, you got to man up and say, nice block, dude. And you don't go after him in the next play for a flagrant foul. That's when you know you've curbed your ego. Instead of giving them a lecture about pride and the dars about it, that's the place to learn it. You see what I'm saying? There was one time we were playing, I remember like it was yesterday, we were playing, this kid has the ball, he's about to take a shot. And from a distance, his father came out of the house. He just looked at him. He dropped the ball and ran over to his house. Any normal teenager would at least take what? At least take the shot and go. The ball's in your hand, man. You know? Or let me finish the play and then I'll go. You know? Time out. Nothing. He just ran. And I said, that, that's what you call a son. That's what Quran means. I don't care what you're doing. You show respect to your father. You know? I couldn't have taught that lesson in the classroom. But now those guys will remember. I can't forget. I can't forget. With teenagers, we got to spend time with them. You guys got to take younger, older uh, uh, youth, college youth, young professional youth, make them mentors for the teenage boys. Take older girls, make them mentors for the teenage girls so they can have those conversations with them. It's really important. Really, really important. That's what I'm concluding with. This, this, I know these are very radical ideas for what Sunday institutions and Saturday institutions should be, but I honestly believe, honestly, that this is the only place we can give them that. There's no, no other place left. Learning, it will be there, and that we can negotiate and figure out what the priorities in learning should be. But inshallah ta'ala, if that social aspect we can really fulfill, I have optimism. And, and those kids, those trouble kids that used to come in 11.30, they run the Sunday school now, by the way. They're all the teachers. You know? It works. That's all I have to share with you guys. Barakallahu li warakum. If you guys have questions, I have, how much time do I have? Oh my God, a whole six minutes. <laughs> questions, you guys? One brother, one sister, so yeah. Barakum um, salam. So to pick up, to pick up, it's easy if we come here and teach the Quran and Sunnah because we know what we're supposed to teach. But when you open it up to what's right, what's wrong, and go hang out here and there, it may be a different approach that we all take. Yeah. And some parents may not like that approach or that opinion or whatever. So it becomes very difficult to keep in a framework that's acceptable by all. And maybe it's not even the right opinion that I have. That's true. That's true. I think there needs to be some sort of national resource for major discussions uh, that can be feeders for all schools. Standardization is a big problem in our schools, right? I'm, I've, more recently, I've become a big believer in creating universal resources that can feed institutions, right? And that's, this is one of those things. Like, we need to take people like Brother Habib Qadri, you know, uh, uh, people that have worked with youth for a long time and have engaged with them to actually take main topics and to create resource discussions on them that become feeders for our discussion so we know how to engage in those discussions. So we can't just go into it blind. We're going to need some prep work ahead of time. But there are major topics that are obviously on the minds of our kids that need to be dealt with. You know, and we can take that thematic approach. What I'm trying to do, at least on one side, is the, to, to offer the Quranic perspective on some of these issues. So more recently, I decided to take up a thematic approach in the Qur'an. But instead of taking themes that are more popularly known as Qur'anic themes, I'm looking at themes that are relevant to Muslim life. And I'm trying to explore those in the Qur'an. So uh, you know, some of you might have heard I did a series on shame, on haya, which would be a good orientation for a, somebody re leading a discussion 
on this topic from the Quranic perspective. What needs to be added to that though is the social sciences perspective from someone like Habib Qadri, so you can guide the conversation in a good way, right? The next one I took on is parenting. I'm, I'm about a third of the way done with that. But I'll take on like a bunch of issues like this that are relevant to Muslims, whether it's youth or families or whatever. But though I, I believe in creating those resources because that, that becomes a feeder for the discussion. You know? Now, you can declare as an institution these are the values that you believe in. You know, on these, these matters, these are the values that you're going to be instilling into your children. So there's no ambiguity into the parents that are bringing their kids here. Like they say, well, I don't want those values in my kids. Forget it. I don't want the school. Fine. We're fine by them. It's their choice. We can't shove things down their kids' throat that they don't want. That's fine. You know, to give you an example, one of the students is trying to do his PhD in, um, uh, you know, uh, chaplaincy, Muslim chaplaincy. So he went to one of the programs and they told him flat out, our chaplaincy program students, the graduation, the graduating class, works on three issues. They write papers and research on three issues. Making homosexuality accept, accept, acceptable to the Muslim community, number one. Uh, number two, women being able to uh, take leadership roles in the Muslim community. And number three, women being able to mar marry non-Muslim men. These are the three things they write about. So if you want a chaplaincy program, PhD out of our program, you'll be writing on one of these three things. We've already decided this is our agenda. He was so happy that they told him the agenda ahead of time, right? <laughs> Good or bad, you declare your agenda. You declare, you just let people, this is what we're going to teach. These are our stances, these are the discussions we're going to have. So if you want our, your, your kid to understand these issues in this way, this is a good place for you. If you don't, then we're not the right place for you. That's okay. You can't please everyone. You know? Yes? Um, how do we address the issue, why am I Muslim to the young one? To the young ones? To the young ones, uh, um, well, very young kids don't need a, like a really crazy elaborate answer, but I probably should be, it's not as, I can't give you a one minute answer for this one, but uh, I believe at a, that at 10, 11, we have to ask that question to the kids, not them ask us. We actually have to build Islam from scratch for our children at the age of 10, 11 in this country. So we have to ask why are we Muslim to them and teach them why. Now, how do we answer that question? I have a particular approach with my own children. I actually recently started my approach with them and sort of walked them through why we're Muslim. A, a, the basic premise of the Quran, you know, in a, in a kid-friendly way. And I actually do this while I'm driving them to school. So I have this basic, it's not a halaqa, it's a conversation I have with them about why you know, how do we know Allah made everything? It was the first conversation I had with them. The second conversation I had with them, you know, do you think if Allah made us so awesome, wouldn't He want to talk to us? Right? Didn't He want to tell us what to, you know, what He would want from us? Because He made us pretty amazing. And He's like, yeah, I have really awesome hands. You know? So we talk about prophets and what they came and did and why we have to respect them. So basically the aqidah things, right? The, you know, the, the, the divinity, revelation, and the afterlife. But bringing it up in a kid-friendly way. And building these three concepts. Basically, iman is three things, right? It's tawheed, risala, and akhirah. It's three, three things. And you can build them logically uh, through discussion. I'm hoping maybe, maybe the next round I do with the next child, I'll record those, <laughs> those conversations. And they might be a benefit to other people. They can use them as springboard conversations. Inshallah. Yeah. No, so I, I was just uh, thinking about you know, what you were saying that the Islamic school should be a place where we all come together we, so that the kids can uh, you know, feel that, that they can bond with other kids. And I think um, you know, what would be a good idea would be to just get the kids out of the school environment, out of places like you, know, you have the morning operation here, take them out to the children's museum, take them out to do some voluntary work at the CAS Association. And, and I think that's what is really missing in our Islamic schools. And whenever we ask the kids, all they want to do is go out on field trips, right? Other than Brunswick Zone, which you always do. If you ask the kids, you know, they say that, well, are you public kids take us to the Chicago Field Museum? Why can't all our Muslim kids also sit on a bus and go? And I think those are the kind of things that would really 
Yeah, I, I agree with that. I agree with that. I, I don't think all the time, but I think it's a good opportunity. And, I, and I, those trips are not just trips. Those trips are opportunities for conversation. So if you think of them that way, I think it, you can get a lot out of them. And it's a budgetary issue too, right? Trips every week can get expensive. Yeah. Um, I really loved the conversation you had. <clears throat> seems like uh, every time we hear uh, lectures, uh, it seems to be like 1,400 years ago. But I could relate everything you said to it. So is there a, uh, are you working on, seems like you understand the whole thing, are you working on a framework that a school would come up and say, we want to adopt uh, no one of these framework for a Saturday school, for a Sunday school? <laughs> That is cool, except, uh, <laughs> so here's the tiny little problem. I've got like a few things on my plate. <laughs> uh, I've, I've got, so um, I'm trying to develop resources in certain areas, and for the next year my focus is actually developing resources for Arabic education. And I'm gonna focus all of my energies on that. Uh, when that is done, inshallah ta'ala, then I'm going to focus my energies on, uh, you know, children's education for the year after that, inshallah. And then the year after that, I'm probably going to focus my energies from then on indefinitely on Quranic education, just across levels. So that's at least in my mind what, the, what my schedule looks like. And I don't like to do multiple things at once because it takes away from focus. So I'd like to just make one thing a priority in a year and make that a resource. Okay, it's available, it's done, work on the next thing. So the ideas I'm sharing with you, but I certainly don't have the, the scheduling opportunity right now to put a proper framework together. However, the skeletal structure I've given you is, in my opinion, more than enough for experienced teachers to put something worthy together. So you don't have to wait on me, I don't, I don't think. No, I, I think I'm saying not just by yourself, but Bayana could be working on it as a project. Yes, well, I like to... Focus on one kind of project in Bayina and then move to the next. I, mean, I don't work on stuff myself. I just have a team of minions that, that do that. Last question. Yes? Do you think that the If the kids are good and they're well educated, then yes. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's, it's the Musab ibn Umayr effect. It's not a new thing. Yeah, but we don't have a resource, right? We don't have kids that are very knowledgeable yet. Right, so we need to train those kids. That's why you, ha you possibly send them away for nine months. <laughs> Over states. No. A little, a little less, a little closer. Arsiluhu <laughs> milayya. Okay. Yeah. You talked a lot about uh, framework and how we can guide the young kids, the, the teenager, and have these conversations. Is there some non Muslim resources we could use? I mean, there are people trained in facilitating. There are, there, there are non-Muslim resources. I'm not as versed in them. I've, I've only casually tapped into some of them. Uh, like teen psychology resources are, I think, really important for Sunday school teachers. Like getting good, good books on teen psychology, uh, teen communication, teen counseling even. Um, also, s some Christian institutions have done phenomenal work in counseling. And we can take advantage of that. Yeah. yeah my question is, uh, in your experience with your Sunday school, how did you I was lucky. I, I was lucky. I had young teachers. And so they were like uh, Play Doh. You could mold them. And I could yell at them and I could tell them, what are you doing? And you know, because I had a very like, like, ilmi youth guy. And they're like, these, these, these brothers, they don't even memorize the surah. I only give them half a page and they didn't memorize it. Yahi, we just tried to read like one page of Ibn Kathir and they didn't even read that and blah, blah, blah. And I was like, hey, bro, let's go play basketball. But Akhi, al ilm, al ilm. I was like, okay. قبل al ilm, نحتاج إلى شيء آخر. Al ilm سيأتي. Ilm will come, relax. Just do this first. Worry about the ilm later. You know? And it, it, but I was able to do that because they were young. With the older instructors, I may not have had that much kind, that kind of luck. 
it's possibly. Yeah. Um, what are like a couple of two important things that you would suggest to parents that they can do to help the weekend school? Uh, I think parents should actually get involved in the weekend school and look look to um, identify resources. Like if you find young people in the community that are maybe young guys that are getting involved at the MSA or girls. Uh, and they're doing some other leadership type activities. You need to find young talent in Chicago and make them Sunday school teachers. You guys need to go on a recruiting campaign. And you need to find the most charismatic young people. And you have a lot of them in Chicago, you do. There's some really great kids here. I just saw a youth group yesterday of like, I think it's like 80 sisters that meet every week, they have programs. You know, there's some really cool stuff happening here. Find those kids and you know, pay them and you know, bring them here. Yeah. Um, what do you yeah. with the child who gets a struggle every weekend? I don't want to go. Um, what is it fair to talk to the teachers to personalize their lesson? Like, you know, no. Well, they shouldn't have homework anyway. I told you no homework. <laughs> no homework. <laughs> don't take your child to Sunday school. <clears throat> if your child doesn't want to go, don't bring them to Sunday school. What are you doing? Why do, you, why do you put your child in a place they don't want to be? They will resent you for it. And they'll hate the masjid or the school. Don't do that. Just take them when there's a trip. Ease them back in. Sorry, guys. I got to go. Assalamu alaikum.